Hello, and welcome to Marriage Unchained, the art of one flesh, where saving marriages, saving families, and saving souls is the flavor of the day. Now, let's join our host and author of Marriage Unchained, Catholic Alpha Radical, Jerry Jacobs, Jr. Welcome to episode 14. Today's focus on location at Holy Rosary Catholic Church in Indianapolis, Father Louis Guardiola. How to for Divorce, part two. So sit back, relax, take a chill pill, and get ready to rock. But don't duck. Can you feel it? Catholic Alpha Radical coming at you now. Hello, and welcome to Catholic Alpha Radical. A Catholic relationship podcast giving you winning tactics for marriage problems, girlfriend problems, and intimacy problems for men. Also, where my main mission is to keep you out of divorce court and where marriage unchained, the art of one flesh, divorce combat coaching is the flavor of the day while also helping men understand marriage and courting, not dating in the catholic faith why because dating is for sex and courting is for marriage this is episode 14 bam our first segment is the quote of the day so let's do this quote certain victorians in their education, practically denied sex as a function of personality. Certain sexophiles of modern times deny personality and make a god of sex. The male animal is attracted to the female animal, but a human personality is attracted to another human personality. The attraction of beast to beast is physiological. The attraction of human to human is physiological, psychological, and spiritual. End quote. Venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, three, to get married. Please remember to share this podcast with someone needing help in their marriage or relationship. Rate this podcast if listening on iTunes. Subscribe to this podcast if listening on CatholicAlpha.com to get new episodes in your email today. Our next segment is Catholic Alpha's Radical Rant of the Day. The Cowardice of Men, the Top 21 Reasons Men Have Caused the 2018 Scandal in the Catholic Church and Why We're Not Going to Take It Anymore. You got that right. <laughs> Before I start, this will be a 21-episode series, one per show. We are now up to number 14. Woo, we're starting to close out. We're getting on the home stretch pretty soon. Also understand that the infiltration by the Catholic Church with homosexuality and radical feminism, plus the watering down of the faith and the stripping away of the Latin mass was planned in order to destroy the morality of those within the church, priest and laity, and the teaching, and this is not the teaching of the church, okay? Radical feminism, homosexuality, um, uh, the watering down the faith is not the actual truth of the Catholic faith. It's not God's word, okay? Please understand that this is not something that the church condones. And like I always say, there are evil people in every church. OK, and we have to make sure that we bring that evil into light, which is what this podcast, which is what this section is about today. Why 
was the church infiltrated with homosexuality, radical feminism, and trying to destroy our morality? Why was this done? Like I said earlier, to destroy the American family, to destroy our morality, and to destroy American patriotism. And what was the reason? What is the purpose? So that we become more susceptible to communistic ideas. And if we think the new world order ideas, the communist ideas, which is basically what, what is the, that ideology really? That ideology is we want to control you and everything you do. We want you under complete power and complete subject to us. Basically, we are gods and you are must show us reverence and worship us. This is basically what these two things are. OK, and if you want that, hey, go for it. But huh, I don't think you do. But um, in episode two of the Catholic Alpha Radical podcast, I did a very in-depth. Um, I did a very in-depth um, um, show on this. And also, uh, if you listen to um, episode 13 with Father uh, Guardiola, he also speaks a little, about, a little bit about it and confirms what I said um, about the infiltration of the church and um, Bella Dodd and how they infiltrated with homosexuality on purpose and things like that. So anyway, many people want to bash the Catholic Church, you know how folks are. They want to bash what you're doing and forget what to look at what they're doing. Um, or worse, leave the Catholic faith because of the current scandal. And that is exactly what the evil one, evil one wants you to do. Why? Because he left God. He left Christ. He left the church. He did it. So he wants you to do it. Why? So you can be down in hell within it with him on a daily basis. <laughs> also understand um, we must understand that there are many Judases among us. Are you going to abandon Christ too? And that's another thing. If you leave the church, if you leave the Catholic faith, if you stop being a Christian, um, because whenever a scandal happens in, in the church or whenever something goes wrong or something doesn't go your way, basically what you're doing, you're abandoning Christ. He wasted his time on you. All right. So um, next, we must fight within the church. This is how Christ demands it, because this is the church he created. You can't change the church outside the church. Bam. Now, let's get started with number 14 of the top 21 reasons that men are responsible for the 2018 scandal in the Catholic Church. But first, let's review the first 13. Number one was refusal to accept our role as men. Number two was men allowed the men in the Catholic Church, popes, cardinals, bishops, priests, deacons to water down, dilute the teachings of the Catholic faith. Number three, men didn't fight for Christ during Vatican II. They didn't battle for his word, his purpose, his, his teachings. Number four, an unwillingness to sacrifice for Christ. Number five, men, they have nothing they are willing to die for. Number six, men have begun raising soft and selfish boys, a.k.a. wusses. Number seven, men don't understand our mission and purpose as men, which is to protect, defend, and serve God, marriage, wife, children, society at large. Number eight, men, we didn't crush feminism. Number nine, Men, we didn't crush the Protestant revolt. Number 10, men, we didn't crush contraception, a.k.a. birth control. Number 11, men, we didn't crush abortion. Number 12, men, we didn't crush so-called same-sex marriage. Number 13, men, we didn't crush no-fault divorce. Father Guardiola spoke, um, um, spoke on that and was going to speak on that today as well um, in this episode. So be sure and don't turn it off. Keep listening. Now, before each number, I will read a quote directly from the document containing Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano's testimony. So that you can understand the gravity of this situation and move to destroy and speak out against it in your environment, 
which is what your church, marriage, your family, work and society at large. Men, you can only control your environment. Do not become overwhelmed with stuff. You must preach, teach and influence your environment. OK, stop trying to worry about the world, what the president's doing, trying to worry about what the pope's doing and all that stuff. What you need to do is find out the truth, influence your environment, and then you God will hold you up higher because you did what you were supposed to be doing. All right. Do not get overwhelmed with this stuff. I'll also place a link to the full document in the show notes. So the next quote is quote number 14, Archbishop Vigano's um, testimony on the abuses of Cardinal McCarrick. This one's a little long. So please try and stay with me. Quote, Bishop Paul Butkowski, emeritus of Mechuchen and Archbishop John Myers, emeritus of Newark, covered up the abuses committed by McCarrick in their respective dioceses and compensated two of his victims. They cannot deny it and they must be interrogated in order to reveal every circumstance and all responsibility regarding this matter. Cardinal Kevin Farrell, who was recently interviewed by the media, also said that he didn't have the slightest idea about the abuses committed by McCarrick. Given his tenure in Washington, Dallas, and now Rome, I think no one can honestly believe him. I don't know if he was ever asked if he knew about Maciel's crimes. If he were to deny this, would anybody believe him given that he occupied positions of responsibility as a member of the Legionnaires of Christ? Regarding Cardinal Sean O'Malley, I would simply say that his latest statements on the McCarrick case are dis dis disconcerting and have totally obscured his transparency and credibility, end quote. Now, look, today, you know, my wife, she's something. She knows that I read these this quote um, in this document every show until it's going until it's done. And she <laughs> so she 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 found a video with Cardinal McCarrick after the 2001 scandal, I guess. Um, and she wanted me to watch it. I didn't watch it, of course. I didn't have time yet. But she said, yeah, it's disgusting how. After the um, after the 2001 um, uh, uh, little boys abuse scandal that McCarrick was on video in front of the media with a lot of other priests in the um, audience talking about how he didn't know anything and how disgusting it is and how he's going to do how they need the, what the church needs to do, all these changes we need to make and come to find out he's one of the main perpetrators. And that's the that's all the quote I was saying on that today. That's all I'm going to say on that, because it's really self-explanatory. We have to end this. We have to end this right now. And don't let it go away. Teach your children. Influence your environment. Moving on. Realize these top 21 reasons in no certain order as they are fed up on by one another. So all the 21 reasons that I've listed, uh, the previous 13 so far, and then the next uh, eight or nine that we're going to do, I don't put them in any order because why? Because all these things together give us what we have today, okay? You know, why the church is not unified, why the Protestants are not together, um, why we have the abuse, the sexual abuse in the church, you know, why priests are having sex with women and having sex with boys and men. You know, all these things is a culmination of denying what God has asked us to do. And this is why we have what we have. So what is the number 14 reason men have caused the 2018 scandal in the Catholic Church? And drum roll. We. Didn't crush ecumenism. Ecumenism. Woohoo! What is ecumenism? 
A lot of you are probably asking that. Basically, a hope for a one world religion while the Catholic faith bargains or compromises the truth of Christ in order to persuade the Protestants to return to God's one true church, Catholicism. So let's, let's, make, let's get this straight, okay? The Catholic faith is the prime faith. It's the number one faith. It's the faith that God, that, that Christ left, that Christ started. It's the, you know, he left it for the church, okay? And I'm going to go into a couple of scripture verses that, that prove that here in a minute, okay? So, Protestants, what does Protestant mean? Protestants mean, Protestant means that Protestants, and who are the Protestants? Methodists, Lutherans, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, all the other so-called Christian faiths that are protesting against God's church. Christ church. <laughs> Christ Church, the the Catholic Church, okay? So that's why they're called Protestants. And most Protestants know that, um, especially in the Lutheran and the Methodist, in those um, religions, and those, those, those sects, they really understand, and the Baptists do too. Um, so those are Protestants, okay? So basically, again, ecumenism is what the Catholic faith, the, the people, the men in the Catholic Church, you know, the powers that be, they decided that they want to try to get everybody to come together and reunify the church. But the problem is they're going to do it the wrong way. They're trying to compromise. You can't compromise with people that are doing emotion all the time. Okay. So um, on Catholic Answers, which is Catholic.com, um, there is an article written by Father Brian Harrison speaking com and comparing two documents on ec ecumenism. Vatican II's fallible decree on ecumenism, Unitatis Redintec Gradio, represents a significant departure from traditional doctrine. It severely contradicts Pope Pius XI's 1928 encyclical on fostering true religious unity, Mortalium Animos, meaning on religious unity. I'm probably not saying these Catholic terms, I mean, these are religious, these are Latin terms, right? But hey, that's my sons. They take Latin. I don't. <laughs> Next. Um, so this uh, Mortalium Animos, this document was created to recite the Catholic Church's position in response to the fledgling movement for religious unity, which had been gathering steam um, in the liberal Protestant circles since the late 19th and early 20th centuries. See, man, we always think this stuff is new. Nothing's new. People don't change. Ever since Adam and Eve, people don't change. We are broken. When are we going to get this through our thick skulls? We think we're so advanced. We think our phones and our tech and our weapons and our technology makes us a better human person, and it don't. Moving on. In this article, Father Harrison basically ends up stating that the document in Vatican II isn't as bad as it seems. And, <laughs> oh, whatever, man. And that is and that it doesn't really contradict Pope Pius's encyclical that much. But I say what I always say about Vatican II and the things that come out of Vatican II. It, Vatican II says a lot of truth. But what does it do? It hides it in the murky waters, underlying themes that have caused the last 60 years of tragedy in the Catholic Church. That's what Vatican II does. It has all these things in there. There's a lot of truth in Vatican II, I'm sure. But you know what? Everybody, a lot of people try to say, well, it didn't change anything. Well, it really didn't change anything, but it didn't matter because what the men did that sat in that, in that chamber they allow things to come out of that that have caused the things that are going on today. And, and they can try to deny it all they want. But the things that have, that have protruded from Vatican II are completely and almost totally responsible for the things that are happening today. Why? Because people stop practicing the word of God in the proper way. Next, in this document, um, Pope Pius XI flatly forbade any Catholic participation in inner church or inner religious meetings and activities motivated motivated by the desire for restoring church unity. Now why would Pope Pius XI do that? He did he because he knows what happens is when people start to don't know their faith, they get scandal and they start not understanding and then they go and try to deal with Protestants 
people who are outside the faith, what happens is they, the people, the Catholics start not understanding and start um, losing their faith. Okay. And that's why it's in, in, that we should be influencing the Protestants because we're the ones with authority, not the Baptist faith, not the Baptist church, not the Methodist church. Okay. And that's why Pope Pius XI, he knew that he knows people don't change. We don't, we like it when think we compromise. That means because God's word is not that easy to go by. We all know that, you know, praying and not, not having sex when we want to, not getting drunk when we want to, not taking drugs when we want to. That stuff is hard not to do, you know? And so when we start, Pope Pius XI knew that because he knew that people like it when you relax, they re relax the church's rules. Because when you, you relax the church's rules, then everybody's everybody gets to do what they want. Okay. So Vatican II authorizes and positively to lean, positively encourages Catholic participation in such activities within certain limits. See, there's there's Vatican II again. Going against he put out something that goes against another Pope. That doesn't make any sense to me. But anyway, people do what they're gonna do. So next, we have to realize and wonder. Who is evangelizing who here? Which is what I just said. Christ's word is not a debate or a compromise. The truth is the truth. And who has authority in interpreting that truth? Is it the Methodists? Is it the Baptists? The Jehovah's Witnesses? Hey, or the Muslims? Who did Christ leave in charge and give authority to carry on his church as he returned to his father? Yep. Peter, the first pope of the Catholic Church, and as usual, people who don't understand Christ and his faith and only doing emotional are completely delusional. Why? Because people like it when they can do what they want to do. They think it's going to make them happy, and of course it doesn't. You know the pre you know it's that it's that the President Obama hope for change or Bishop Barron's uh, there is a reasonable hope that all men are saved ideology. Basically, what those two things mean is there's no hell. Nobody goes to hell. Hell, according to many of them, even Judas is not in hell. Hmm. Think about that one. Look, either Christ is God or he isn't. Either what God said or either what Christ said in the Gospels is complete truth or it isn't. Either God is incapable of lying or he is. If Christ is the God man and can't lie and has revealed his truth in the Gospels and we love him and we want to please him, which means plain and simple, complete and utter and total obedience, then compromising on his word in any form is heretical. And if Christ left Simon Peter in charge, which Christ changed Simon's name to Peter. Why? Because it means rock and it, it, it means rock. Why would Christ even do that? He changed his name to rock for a reason. And I'm going to say, say it in his scripture next, the scripture coming up anyway. Um, and if Christ left Simon Peter in charge, who is the first Pope, which also means every Bishop in Peter's line, the magisterium of the Catholic church has complete authority to interpret and administer God's dogma, doctrine and discipline. All right. Basically, the Catholic Church should be presenting the Protestants with God's word, which is what the truth. We just established that either God, Christ is God or he isn't. Either God is God or he isn't. He's either omniscient and all knowing or he isn't. OK. Basically, the Catholic Church, should, be, like I said, should be presenting the Protestant for the Protestants with God's word, the truth. And they should be learning what God truly revealed in the Catholic faith, not fighting it. Tell me one thing. How many Protestant churches have saints in them? P how many how many Protestant churches have the doctors of the church, the fathers of the church, people that have has been things that have been revealed to them, and these people are in are in, in the beatific vision right now. Okay, things that that God has re and the angels have revealed to them, so that they can reveal it to us, just like um. St. Faustina revealing what hell looks like. Everybody tries to deny that stuff. Nobody wants to talk about hell, but there was a saint that was taken to hell and shown hell and came back and tried to tell everybody. 
and nobody will, nobody listens except the, the people in the faith, in the Catholic Church. Basically, what this means is the Protestants should be listening instead of talking. Learn. Sure, a lot of Protestants, I'll give them credit, they know the Bible. Some of them know it back and forth. But in my experience with Protestants and other people uh, dealing with Protestants, um, they know a few verses. They can tell you five or ten verses that they didn't memorize over the years. And every time you say something, they bring up one of those five verses. So do they truly know the Bible? And if they do know the Bible, are they interpreting those verses correctly? How do they know that? That's why you have 40,000, 50,000, 30,000 denominations, because you got all these men who think they know the Bible or interpret the Bible more than the Catholic Church does, who Christ left and gave authority for that. So you say that the Catholic Church is doing what is, is doing uh, men with, uh, by men. Who is the, doing the men thing? Who created a religion of men? You did. You, Mr. Lutheran, you, Mr. Mr. Methodist, you, Mr. Baptist, you, Mr. Uh, Church of God's Water on the corner of 21st and Capitol in Indianapolis. Come on. Who really has the religion of men? You have to understand that. And we're going to go on that. I'm going to keep going. So uh, another thing, Protestants say the Catholic Church is arrogant and many ignorant Catholics say the same thing. They say we're arrogant. Why? Because we claim we are the true church church, and that Christ left us in charge. Now, look, the Catholic Church, the men in the Catholic Church are not saying this. The people in the Catholic Church are not saying this. That's Christ saying this. Why would a church, why would somebody just go and say, see, if, if you if you if, if, if you are a, the, the pastor of a, of a of a Baptist church, who gave you authority to start that church? Who gave you authority to, where do you get your authority from? Why should anybody believe you? Why should anybody, just like the president of the United States, he is given that position by who? The people of the country. If he was some Joe Blow drunk off the street and tried to say the same stuff that he says, would anybody listen to him? That's where, that's why you have to have authority. Authority comes from God, which was handed down by Christ. And if anybody is not in the Catholic faith, you have no authority. That's why when people interpret the Bible, they have no they have no reason to interpret the Bible. They have no authority to interpret the Bible because the Bible has to be interpreted in the time of Christ. OK, come on, dude. So I'm going to mention two scriptures that give the Catholic Church complete authority and the right to claim this fact. And look. The Catholic Church is Christ's church. Deny it if you want, but that's called arrogance. That's called presumption. You presume that even though you're getting the truth of the word and you're denying, you're denying the church, that you can deny it all you want and you have no consequences. That's not true. Christ, when, you, when, Christ, when the word of Christ is given to you by, through the Holy Spirit, and listen, God uses people to bring truth to you. He doesn't send an angel. Okay, that was for the Blessed Mother and Joseph. Okay, <laughs> all right. So when a person comes to you and says the Catholic faith is the true faith of God, and here's why, and you ignore him, that was the Holy Spirit talking to that person, talking to you through that person to get you to mend your life, to come to God's church. Okay, so I'm going to mention two scriptures that give us complete authority, the Catholic Church, Christ Church. And to fight uh, and that fight the claim to this fact that proved our claim. OK, number one, Matthew 16, 18. I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. So logically, logically, think about it. Remember, I said earlier that Simon Pete, that, that, that Christ changed Simon's name to Peter and Peter means rock. Hmm. So is it a coincidence that in Matthew 16, 18, Christ says, I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock, I will build my church. Peter means rock. Bam. It don't matter if it's a big rock, little rock, puny rock. It is what it is. And also, some of you say that it's a, it's a, it's a small rock. It doesn't matter. Christ is the huge rock. He's the kingdom. Okay. So he's not saying Peter is over him. That's why I name it a little rock. That's why you have to get complete and proper interpretation 
okay, of what the what the scriptures are saying, not your own stuff, not what you think the Holy Spirit is giving to you. Okay, next scripture number two, Matthew eighteen eighteen. Amen. I say to you, whatsoever you shall bind upon earth shall be bound also in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose upon earth shall be loosed shall also shall be loosed also in heaven. Bam. Okay, that is Christ talking to the apostles. All right, he's telling them, I'm giving you authority. You 12, I'm giving you authority over my church when I'm gone. Why? Because I have to go back to the Father. I have to do my mission. I have to get crucified. I have to sacrifice my life for all the sin and craziness in the world. I have to do that. But I don't want what I've done to be in vain. I have to, uh, it had my what I've done has to be carried on. And I'm giving you the apostles to carry this on. That's why he says, whatever you loose and bind is also in heaven. So he's giving the apostles the he's giving the apostles the um the uh authority, which is and then he took he does what? He be he's sure he he makes sure he places someone in charge who is Peter. Now, how does that go to the Catholic faith? It goes like this. Peter is the first bishop. He's the first pope, okay? So all what he does is they, they ordain all the apostles that have been ordained by Christ. So those apostles, they ordain, they have to, they, they die, right? So they have to leave, they have to do what Christ did and carry it on. So they give authority to the next priest that they ordain, who then becomes a bishop. Okay? You have to understand how this works. And that's why the Catholic faith has the authority because when Christ, when Christ died, Peter was given authority and every bishop in the Catholic faith, every priest is, is, is come down from Peter, from Christ through Peter, all the way down through for 2000 years. Okay. We have succession all the way down to the current, current Pope, Pope Francis. That is why we have authority. That is why we have authority. Mr. Luther, okay, please understand that. We're just not talking. Next, uh, um, Catholics should be proud and thankful Christ charged us with holding his church together. But many of us are ashamed of our duty and role in this matter. The truth is the truth. There can only be one. Our job as Catholics is to present the Protestants with the truth. Then... Then and look, I know that everybody is different. You got to bring folks along. You can't just go out and get in the Protestant faith and start talking about all oh, the Christ, the Catholic Church is this. No, you have to be a friend, make a friend, be a friend, and bring a friend to Christ. Because you have to, you can't go out and start yelling and 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 uh, evangelizing a total stranger. That hardly ever ever works. And I understand that a lot of Protestants is not their fault that they, they were brought up in this mess. And it's not a lot of the Catholics' fault either. It's the men in the Catholic faith who have watered down the faith and don't teach the fruits of death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Okay? So, next. Our job as Catholics is to present the Protestants with the truth. They then have the free will to deny God's word or accept it. I talked about that earlier. Then there can be no compromise. And, when, and we've seen what compromise has done to not only the Catholic Church, but Christians worldwide. We are now engaged in the foggy faith. That's what I like to call it, the foggy faith. The watered-down, vague version of the Catholic faith, of Christ's word. The faith nobody understands or can concretely agree upon. Is this what Christ wanted, 40,000 so-called denominations? Think about that. Is that what Christ really wanted? all fighting with each other and compromising on what he's revealed. Compromise, when it comes to the Christian faith, causes utter confusion. This is how you destroy the family. Huh, look at the family today. This is how you get women to murder millions of babies. Huh, look at Planned Parenthood and the big buildings they have in every city and what neighborhoods, in the poor neighborhoods. What is it called? What is that called? It's called genocide. This is how you get priests to abuse boys. Uh, 2002, uh, 2018. This is how you do it. This is how you control the masses. 
we are completely controlled and manipulated by now. And if it wasn't for a lot of people who study the faith and, and not just not just Catholics, Protestants, too. If it wasn't for Christians, man, devout Christians and devout patriotic human persons in the this country, we would already have been Trump would have lost. Hillary Clinton would have been in and we'd be in martial law right now. Don't think it ain't the truth. If you don't know what, think what I'm saying is the truth, you better look it up and ask somebody. OK, um, so this is how you control the masses. You make everything foggy and debatable. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody, everybody can can talk. Everybody can debate on the truth, whether the truth is the truth or not, where the God is real, that kind of crazy stuff. And again, what did the men in the Catholic faith do? Sit back, remain distracted, become wusses and ate bonbons. How is that for truth? How is that for truth? Bam, bam, bam. Think about it. If what I said is right or wrong, think about it. If you disagree with what I'm saying, that's fine. Send your question or your comment to radicalquestions at catholicalpha.com. What do you think about what I've just said? Send your questions or comments to radicalquestions at catholicalpha.com. Again, please remember to share this podcast with someone needing help in their marriage or relationship. Rate this podcast if listening on iTunes. Subscribe to this podcast if listening on CatholicAlpha.com to get new episodes in your email today. Our final segment today is our great and popular warrior stories. Warrior stories is our segment on ordained men who are spirit, who are fighting the spiritual battle in the Catholic church every day through sacrificing their lives, bodies, hearts, and souls for our ultimate warrior Christ. And today's warrior is father Louis Guardiola of the fathers of mercy generalate in South Union, Kentucky. Ordained May 31st, 2001. His current outreach is the Fathers of Mercy, where he preaches retreats, parish missions, conferences, and 40-hour devotions. Father Guardiola studied under Father John Harden as a lay catechist for seven years. Father Guardiola also hosts his, his own radio show on Alpha International Radio every Wednesday from 3 to 4 Eastern. We are here uh, this week at Holy Rosary Catholic Church in Indianapolis, celebrating our second annual parish mission to get the parish fired up and ready to go. And Father Guardiola is the priest that is doing that mission. And so I thought it'd be a great idea to interview him and get his thoughts. A lot of things going on in the church. And this is part two of our interview where we go into relationship questions. So please welcome Father Lewis. Guardiola. So today, married couples are encouraged to exclude God from their bedrooms. Why is this a grave mistake? And what are three ways married couples can involve God more in their sex lives? And what are the benefits to doing this? Well, first of all, I, I see sexuality in the context of the entire human person. You know, I say conjugal relationships. Well, first of all, when a person is married in the Roman Catholic Church, it's a sacramental God. Marriage, God is already there. He's blessed that relationship. In fact, marriage is a covenant, is a reflection, a visible reflection of love between husband and wife of God's covenantial, unconditional love for his church. And that's what the uh, marriage is. So God is already part of it. You can't exclude it. I mean, you can say, oh, I don't want God or deny it, but he's already in that relationship. Take a look at the wedding of Cana. There was our Lord, you know. He was blessing marriages. I love it when I preach it. I'm going to preach that uh, on Our Lady, by the way. So okay. Give you a little uh, taste of what I'm going to say <laughs> on the last night of the mission. Uh -huh. So, So number one, God is already part of that. 
Number two, marriage is a natural and a sacramental reality. And the biology, the, the love, the attraction men have and women for each other has been blessed by God because it's God's natural way of bringing men and women together to procreate, to bring new life into the world, procreate the uh, uh, human race, keep the uh, human race going, and of course at the same time t through the procreation of their children and body also to procreate their faith in the children as well. Now you said your duty right. as the Catholic priest in the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's also the reality. Well, no. Yeah. What you say is good. Okay, so I'm going to take you a little deeper cause okay. I need, because I am the type I want to give them action steps, right? So my the second part of the question is, and what are the three ways married couples can involve God more in their sex lives? Well, in the far as their conjugal relationships, first, prayer. Okay? Yes. So pray, and even before they enter into conjugal relationships, that, that there would be a holy um, a mating and a relationship with each other. Secondly, study. Study what the marriage is. A lot of people don't even know what marriage is. Amen, Study the sacrament of the marriage and what it's all about, you know? Yes. And thirdly, be conscious of the responsibility before God. Uh, both, there's two aspects of matrimonial love. Unitive love, mm -hmm. which is, you know, strengthening the relationship between uh, each other and their conjugal embrace and love and, and mutual affection. And, and secondly, the, the uh, procreative love that to be open to bring a new life because children are a blessing to marriage. And so just, can you give me like one or two benefits? If, if let's say if, if a, a married and I always go from that, they, they don't, the married couple doesn't know the mm -hmm. men, the man is ignorant. Okay. okay. Of the marriage. Like we just talked about. Right. Can you give me one or two? If, if a man, if a family, if a man did this, and and his wife and, and brought this to his wife and suggested that they pray before making mm -hmm. love, during or after. Right. Um. And and they started bringing God more into their bedroom and mm -hmm. embracing. It takes three to make love. Like, right. You know. Sure. What are one or two benefits of to their marriage? That as they grow in the relationship through the years, they'll have a deeper appreciation and love and respect for each other as human persons. Number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, you tell me get three things or two things? Two's good. Two things. Okay, that number one. Number two, in that deepening of mutual respect and growing and love for each other and development of the relationship, that will also communicate it to its children. And that will confirm wow. them in their faith. And yes. when they get married, you know, as they grow up and mature in adulthood. Thank you, Father. So, that was beautiful. I've just seen that from experience. Yeah. <laughs> um Name the worst marriage situation you've encountered in your counseling sessions, and how did you handle it? Unfortunately, it was in my own family. Okay. I had a, a very close relative who had was was married outside the church. He was in illicit, invalid marriage, so he's in a state of mortal sin, mm -hmm. adultery. So I set up for him uh, a priest so he could get an annulment process. I w worked with him all the way through him. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the woman, he did get married in the church, only used that so she could uh, have access to his money because my brothers uh, or my close relatives works a very, has a very substantial salary, is a highly salaried, um, very skilled uh, uh, tradesman. And so she entered into it uh, only for the money, so she just kind of humored him. Okay. So when the time for them to get married came, came after I made all the preparation, and my mother, of course, was you know very supportive. Then at the end, I and my mother were excluded. At the moment, oh yeah, at the at moment, the moment, they moment got, of the marriage. Yes, I, I didn't even know he got married. I had to find out secondhand from one of his fellow coworkers, and so uh, that was the most uh, disappointing. Uh, thing and then uh, it basically led to my uh not my brother not speaking to me anymore my very close relative because there was a number of other things ramifications from that and it's like you know you made a mockery out of marriage i mean you excluded your brother i could have married you didn't want me to and my mother just because this woman didn't want us so 
let's go into that a second. Okay. Like today, right? Mm. A lot of priests say, and a lot of which has come in, you know, whatever priests do, because right. they're kind of the, it kind of flows down to the laity. Mm-hmm. So the lady, they'll go, you know, you should never cut off contact mm. from your daughter or son right, right. or mom or dad mm-hmm. ever. Mm. I, I've been there and I kind of don't agree because so there I've, comes I've a, been there too. Okay. So this don't, we're well, not here to talk to me. We're here to talk to you. So okay. what do you think? Well, how do, the thing how is, do you do that? How do you deal with that situation? Well, the thing is they cut themselves off. Because a lot of time they use emotional and psychological uh, blackmail. They say, if you don't, even as a priest, attend my marriage outside the church or baptize on the church, I'll never talk to you again. And I says, well, I don't <gasps> want that to happen, but I can compromise my faith and my mother too. In fact, uh, I had a niece who wanted me to marry her in the church, but she dumped me when she found out she had to go to uh, prenuptial classes. I got dumped by two nieces, by the way. <laughs> and so I got a lot of experience with this. And so, no, we don't want to break off contact, but, but at the same time, I have, you're asking me to surrender my most uh, intimate faith, beliefs. My faith is everything to me. You're asking me to destroy everything that's within me that I've lived for and sacrificed for. I says, I'm sorry, I can't. And my mother says, and I can't denounce not only my faith, but denounce my son who's a priest. It's like, you know, pe- we sent, pe- people say, you know, God's going to send you to hell or God is an unmerciful mm-hmm. God. No, it, no what you just said, right. we sent ourselves to, to hell. We yeah. cut off contact with God. Mystery of iniquity. Like I said, in the first night of the mission, yeah, four last things. It's right there in the catechism. The final definitive, because even in the situation like that, I'm still praying for my brothers and sisters who've cut themselves off and other relatives. And that's what we do. But you know, yes. several have come back already. Same here. Yeah, it took 15 years or so. Same here. Yeah. Same here. Um, and can you, the other night at the mission, you said, like last night, you're talking about confession. Mm-hmm. And you said, when you, when a couple is married mm-hmm. or a single cup, a single boy, I'm single, well, I'm not going to say boy. It could be a man in his seventies. Right. He has a girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And especially in marriage or anything, you said that when, you commit a mortal sin, which if a man has a girlfriend, that's usually sixth and ninth commandment. Right. Usually sex. Yes. And in a marriage, it could be anything. I mean, you know, anything. You said the Holy Spirit jumps. God, he's, the Holy Spirit's gone. He removes himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Right. The whole indwelling uh, presence, the Holy Trinity, sanctifying grace. Yes. How, how, do, will that, how will that affect a marriage? Well, when there's no grace in marriage, then you're open to all kinds of temptations like uh, drug addiction, pornographic addiction, alcoholic addiction, adultery, all kinds of things, uh, abuse of the spouse. People think, it, people think it's luck, don't they? It's yeah. bad luck. Yeah. It ain't bad luck. You no, know, it isn't. No, no, it's loss of grace that makes you uh, vulnerable to all these kinds of sins, and that's exactly what happens. It removes the protection of, in the marriage. Name the worst singles relationship situation you've encountered in your counseling sessions, and how did you handle it? Single relationships as a... Like boyfriend, girlfriend, like a, a, a man comes to you and says, mm-hmm. Father, I'm dating this girl, and mm-hmm. blah, 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 and mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be have to be my nephew. He, he had a, a series. I was his godfather. I've got eight godchildren because I was ordained at 48, so, you know, I lived up. <laughs> Long time before I became a priest. Uh-huh. And he went with one affair after another after another. And I says, Chris, you got to stop this. And it came to a point where he had this one uh, lady who wasn't even, she was living apart from her husband. She was estranged from her husband, but she hadn't even been divorced yet. And I told him how wrong that was in every way, shape, or form. And then he got in an argument with her. And he was living with her, and then he got in his car, took off, and then she got in his car and followed him. And then several miles down the road, she got involved in a fatal car accident, hmm. and they had to airlift her to the hospital. She didn't make it. And even after that, he was still living in sin and having these affairs. I says, Chris, you know, a person died because of this. When are you going to learn? So finally, he met this wonderful girl from Lima, Peru, and uh or he's working as an electrician, and she was working in the um, hotel management to get her M.A., fell 
in love with her, took care, you know, he took her home, had a chase relationship with her. Uh -huh. And then uh, finally she brought him back into the church and got married in the church in Lima, Peru. And See how strong women are, the right woman is, the that's virtuous right. woman is. That's right. And he says she's an angel. And that's what we, I say, uh, uh, now people look at me like I'm crazy when I say right. this. No, I tell women, I will say to a woman, no man. I, matter of fact, we had a conference and I stood mm -hmm. up in front of a room of 50, right. 200 women. I said, right. No man will ask you to marry him if he doesn't look at you and go, how can I be worthy of her? That's right. That's exactly what Chris said. And he was 38 years old, so he was a mature man. Yep. So. Man, we want a woman that we, even if she ain't, we want her better than us. Right. <laughs> now she's made him better. It's it's weird, though. I mean, he had the spirituality within him. I mean, he he mm -hmm. went to uh, the National Shrine of uh our Lady of Fatima, New Jersey. So he had the faith in it, but she brought it out in him. Okay. So. Um, if a husband hates being around his wife, mm -hmm. what are some things he can do to remedy this? I'm going to say it again. If a husband hates being around his wife, what are some things he can do to remedy this? Well, the number one thing he's got to find out, what is about her that makes him hate her? Mm -hmm. He's got to address that. Right. That's the one. Secondly, uh, through prayer, address the problem and and bring healing into the marriage, you know. And thirdly, if they need counseling with a good Catholic uh, uh, agency, I'm trying to think of one that it does. Um, there's a great, uh, they have weekends and everything. Um, Retrovi? Retrovi, thank you. And yes. then the other one is Marriage Encounter. Yeah, Marriage Encounter. So, so avail themselves of those opportunities and find out what's what's the what's problem. Sometimes, a lot of times, in my experience, a man will hate, or hate his wife or can't stand to be around his wife because of problems from within himself. Sometime in this childhood, Amen. in the way he might have been emotionally, psychologically, or bodily abused or something. Okay. So. When there's a problem in my marriage, mm -hmm. first thing I do is I walk into the bathroom and I look in that mirror. Mm -hmm. What did I do? What am I doing? Right. If me and my wife get into an argument or right. she's upset with me or I'm upset with her, mm -hmm. I go and say, what did I, what is my problem first? I try to fix me first right. and think of all the scenarios of what I did. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> I understand. Um, and once I, you know, over the years, I found once I do that mm -hmm. and then there's, because usually it's something that I did to, I'll say 90% of the time. Sure. There's something that I did that I, I should have been like, I could have did better mm -hmm. or I could have fixed before. Mm -hmm. You know, mm. um, should a man marry his best friend? Why or why not? Best friend. Well, I always, I taught marriage for 21 years as a high, as high school religion teacher. And I say, marry the person that God wants you to marry. And so the married, the one that God has, uh, ordained for you to marry. And you will recognize that there'll be no, no question or doubt in your mind that this is the person. And so I guess in that sense, How you would you know, say yes. Uh -huh. This is such a great question because yeah. I've been struggling with it mm -hmm. I, for a lot of my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you know that, though? I mean, how do you know when God, because priests say it all the time. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, everybody says it all the time. Right. Well, I can tell how you. How do you know? Yeah, I can tell you because there's parallels, a lot of parallels between the priesthood and marriage. And there's a lot of parallels between oh, parallel. the priesthood and marriage. Oh, yes. And I knew that the fathers of mercy were for me because when I went with them within 15 minutes, I knew my first visit, I had no doubt whatsoever. I had no questions about it whatsoever. I was totally at peace that this was a community for me, religious community, preaching the gospel and going out in and doing missions all over the country and the world. And I've never, ever, for a nanosecond, ever regretted my decision to be a priest and move the Fathers of Mercy. So that's when you know. When you see that person, you know it's intuitive. There is no question in your mind whatsoever. You don't have to have a list of 80 qualities and go <laughs> to the check, right? Right. I have some people who have done that. You know, my sister-in-law had, had those. Yeah. No, no, you see it and you know it. So when a man... You saying that if first of all a man has to desire to be married, 
which that's has another whole call. podcast. Has to have the call. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. Call the bear. Um, so you're saying when he sees, he say he has the desire, and then he sees, he meets a woman or whatever, or he meets four or five or whatever, mm. he, you're saying he intuitively knows which one for the most that's part right. the guy that's the way it should be. But the problem is people don't go with their intuition. A lot of times they just settle. They say, I'm a certain age, my biological clock is ticking or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and they get involved in that. But instead, they said they should allow the Holy Spirit to guide him and recognize that this is the one. Like my uh, nephew, Chris, he knew that she was the one. There was no question in his mind whatsoever. There was no compromise. He didn't have to not be herself. She didn't have to not be herself. She knew he accepted her totally and unconditionally. There's no question whatsoever. Beautiful. <clears throat> If a wife finds that her husband hates spending time with her, what mm -hmm. can she do to remedy that? Well, first of all, find out why. What's the problem? You know, and people don't even do that much. Yeah, they don't right, even right. go to their husband or wife and say, "You got to communicate." Wrong? What's the problem? You got to communicate. No question about it. Yeah, communication. Yeah, a lot of it. A lot of the problems in marriage and uh, any kind of state of life is communication. Mm -hmm. hmm. So you're saying that she should. First, go to him and ask him. But well, let's well, say she does that. So mm. then what else could she do within herself to? Well, like you said, like you look in the mirror sometimes and say, is there anything that I'm doing that's turning off my husband? Or am I um, being self-willed and want to do one thing all the time when he wants to do something else? For example, uh, she might like to go to the movies or go shopping or something like that. And the... uh her husband might want to go out and see a ball game once in a while, something like that. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that you sh should look at. Mm -hmm. Can um, can the curse of Eve be a problem where, like, her trying to control? If she might, maybe he, she's trying, maybe be trying, maybe trying to control him more or nag him too much, or maybe that's what's pushing him away. What do you think about? Well, that's certainly, it? yeah, certainly that that could enter into it. No question about it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um. If a man is courting and dating slash dating, I, I kind of always separate those two. Mm -hmm. But people under a lot of people don't understand what court, know what courting is. So mm -hmm. on this question, um, so if a man is courting slash dating and starts to realize that his girlfriend is not the one for him, mm -hmm. how should he handle it? Well, very considerately and and very uh, gently, but also very truthfully. Because if, if a man is dating with the intention to marry and he recognizes not the one, then he should let her know gently. And also in the spirit that, you know, if he does not feel this is the person to marry, they will not be happy even if he did marry. So he's sparing her a lot of uh, um, a suffering and angst that would uh, could go on for decades, you know, before they would uh, enter, get divorced. If... Um so let's talk about, so this is the difference between dating and courting now. Yeah, so okay. let's talk about if dating, right. which means basically they've slept together, and let's talk about courting, which most, you know, usually if a, a couple is courting, they're not sleeping together. Okay. How, what is the difference in the breakup? How, how much more dramatic? Well, definitely it's worse <laughs> if, if they've engaged in uh, intimacy with each other. Because there's no way that you can be open with someone and not have feelings and, and establish a kind of a bond with that person. Forever. Forever. And so it's much more uh, traumatic to break off a relationship when you've been uh, intimate with somebody. That's why you need not to be intimate with somebody. You need to be pure and celibate during the uh, courting process as well. You know? Isn't um, Do you find that... Um that both parties can be more objective when they're courting, which means to me, when I say court, mm -hmm. I mean, they're they haven't slept together. Right. Then when they have slept together, which is dating, mm -hmm. they have slept together. Right. Do you find this more that the people can be more objective? Yes. Yes. And, and I, I, even from my own relatives, I've seen that when they've, um, have had sex before or, or do they have a sexuality in their dating process that a lot of times it clouds their judgment and, and the, and the man in particular gets seduced not only in the, in the body, but he also gets seduced in the mind and he's more susceptible to the deception from the 
from the from the female partner, or it could be go the other way too. But usually from the female partner and buys into the lies, and he ends up making a fool out of himself because he confronts families with the lies that that his um, his uh, lover has given to him. So I've seen that too. Yes, I had a um, I had a uh, I had a talk with a a man not too long ago, mm-hmm. and his woman was texting him because she was mad, but he had mm-hmm. he had a, a a child with her, and they weren't right. married. Mm-hmm. And he just could not understand why she's just angry all the time with him. Mm-hmm. And so I couldn't, I, I, I let him get it out mm-hmm. and I took two or three deep breaths mm-hmm. and I said, the problem might be that you have broken promises. Mm-hmm. And he, right. he just couldn't get it. Mm-hmm. And he said, what do you mean broken promises? I haven't promised her anything. I said, when you lay down with her, right. you make promises. Right. Women today, they act like that they can sleep with anybody they want and it doesn't mm-hmm. affect them. Right. But I, I explained to him, no woman is going to sleep with you if she doesn't think somewhere down the line That's in the future right. that we're getting married. That's now, true. it might not be tomorrow. That's it might true. not be three or four years from sure. now. I understand. Mm-hmm. But they... they it to, when you they, A woman, when she sleeps with a man, she's thinking... We're going to be together forever. Right. Absolutely. Right. And so now you had a, she had a baby with you. Right. And now you left her. Mm-hmm. You've bonded with her for life, like we right. just said. And so every time she sees you, mm-hmm. she sees the baby and the baby and all that. And, right. and, and after, you know what? I think after a few minutes, he did start to understand because mm-hmm. he said, you know what? I think you're right because. My mother told me that she's mad at me because we didn't get married. Right. But sure. when they were dating, it was like, oh, we don't have to get married, baby. We don't have to get married. Right. right. I understand. <laughs> I've seen it play out many, many times. If a husband is having thoughts of infidelity, what can he do spiritually to fight this urge? Okay. First, he's got to pray. He's got to go before the Blessed Sacrament. He's got to go to confession more frequently. He's got to go to Mass and receive the Eucharist more. Okay. You know, and then uh, he's got to go back to the time he made his vows and see how special that was and how holy and the commitment he made that was before God himself. And he's got to realize he can never violate it because he's got to answer to God in the church because he made a public vow of eternal fidelity to his wife. How I know how adoration has affected me over mm. the past seven, eight years. But can you explain being what the effect on a man is, especially in his marriage and family, mm-hmm. if he picks up that devotion? Even if it's just to walk in mm-hmm. four, five, six or seven days a week and say, hello, Christ, how are you doing for two minutes and walk mm-hmm. out? Mm-hmm. Can you go into that a little bit? How? That will help how that enhances. Right. Well, first of all, I always make the point that parents and grandparents always tell the children, be careful of the company you keep because the kind of friends you have is the kind of person you become, more or less. The more you spend company with Jesus in adoration, the more you grow in friendship, the more you become like Jesus. That means you become, you're able to love with a more supernatural and deeper, unconditional love. You'll be more charitable. You'll be more chaste. You're more uh, merciful. You'll be more considerate. Because when you experience the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, his unconditional love for you, then that'll communicate it to your own relationship with your wife. You'll have uncommunicate, uh, unconditional love to your wife. So that's the effect that has for a married person. So if there, if there is a Protestant listening, mm-hmm. a Protestant man listening, can mm-hmm. you explain to him what the what the Eucharist is when we say Eucharist, mm-hmm. and I, I'm not maybe thirty. I know it's <laughs> maybe right. thirty seconds to a minute. Mm-hmm. What the Eucharist is, um, what do Catholics consider as the Eucharist, and mm-hmm. what you know? Right. Well, we're going to talk about that tonight, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Eucharist is the body and blood and soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ united in His one divine person. He's holy and entirely and really and truly present to us, not just in the sacrament, but also in person with us. So when you receive the Holy Eucharist, the God-man comes into you, and he comes in 
and takes our human nature and uplifts it to its full divine-like capacity because we're created in the image and likeness of God. So it's God's, it's the reason why God, our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, so he, in sacrifice of his own flesh and blood, could now give us his flesh and blood and communicate the power of the resurrection through the sacramental body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's his real presence, into us to continue to that, to do that. So, okay. What is the funniest or worst or best experience you've ever had when trying to evangelize someone? You're going to have to just pick one of those. Are you talking about a parish mission or person to person? It could or? be person. It could be per, any, anything that you think. Anything. I think the most interesting experience I had in my mission career was I went in Australia. I think it was in 2011. I did a mission in Toowoomba, and the bishop had just been fired by the Vatican the week before. Wow. So I come in there, and they see me as an American priest coming from abroad, and they think somehow I had a, you know, had a, a hand in that, which I didn't, of course. I'm just an American priest. Just hey, man, simple, I'm just coming to hang right, out. I'm just coming to hang out, right. And so I got called a temple, uh, what, a temple policeman and the spy for the Vatican. But part of the reason why this bishop was fired is because for – uh, 25 years or so or more, they didn't have Eucharistic adoration. They didn't have a uh, confession. They had, you know, a private confession. They had that uh, uh, confession uh, where there wasn't any kind of uh, personal sacramental uh, reconciliation. And so I come in there and I did what they had been doing for 25, 30 years. I had one-to-one -one confessions, private confessions. We had Eucharistic adoration mm -hmm. and uh, holy hours. And so the first night of mission, I had 150 people. It was a five-day mission. The next night, I had 300. Wow. The next night, I had five or 600. Fourth night, I had like six or 700, and I ended up with between eight or 900. The Holy and Spirit, the, yeah. man. And I went from 150 to eight or 900 people. And then the word got around <clears throat> in the whole Christian community. There's this American priest who's doing things that have been done in 25, 30 years from America. Uh -huh. you know, and you know, when Did you're he start player country, hating you? That's right. <laughs> and then when when they uh, when they find out, you know, someone's from America. I mean, people are just fascinated in foreign countries. What's America really like? You know. Mm -hmm. So I got an invite from a calf from a Christian radio program, in right there, and it covered half of Australia. And they said we've been asking for 25 years for Roman Catholic priests to talk. We just want to talk. We don't want a you know confrontation or Catholic bashing or priest bashing. I said, sure, we'll talk. So we talked about the Catholic faith, uh, the difference with the Catholic faith here in the United States and and in Australia and the political situation. You know, in Australia, what was my take on it? What was my view on it? And uh, you could see the switchboard; it was lighting up like a Christmas tree. You know, wow. There was hundreds and hundreds of people wanting to call and talk to me, and so we had. Uh, uh, they said it was the greatest um, response they had in the 25 years they've been doing that. Wow. They found it so fascinating uh, about what I had to say. And then I got 100, 150 more people that next night. And, and uh, that night, and a lot of people were um, not of the faith. They wanted to come and hear me because they heard me on the radio and they wanted to see me live, you know. Well, and you so. do have a you have a way of putting things. Because over the last two nights of the mission— People have come to me and my wife because, well, me and my wife, we sponsored the mission. Yeah, sure. We put it on and through the Holy Spirit. You've and, done and a great Father job. Father McCarthy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and our little committee. And, um, they said, you know, the way he puts things, I never thought about it that way. Mm. And, and that's what Christ did. He put things a certain way mm -hmm. to make you think about it from a certain point of right. view. And people right. think, it, like even I go through it sometimes. I'll go, but I said that last podcast. Right. I said that three or four videos ago. Mm -hmm. Right. But first of all, the people you're talking to might not have heard it. Right. And so, but then when you you might put it away that gets John to think about it different than and Mary to think about it True. different. You know. Mm -hmm. So you do have a gift for that. I will say because I have had at least five or ten people come up to me. <laughs> um. So, um. No fault divorce. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a terrible thing. Sure. It, it was a you know, mm -hmm. Mr. Ronald Reagan. Right. Um name three things that no fault divorce has done to harm family and society. 
Well, I can name more than three things. Well, you go as far I as you think, want. <laughs> first of all, the divorce itself mm -hmm. is devastated. It's destroyed the family. It's caused a lot of people to uh, see not to commit to marriage. They're afraid to commit to marriage because they see the devastating effects of the divorce with their parents. So it's destroyed the, uh, I would say, the institution of marriage, number one. Number two, by making divorce much easier, it uh, has caused a lack of commitment for those who do marry. You to say, oh, well, we, it don't work out. We could just have a divorce. We don't have to give no reasons why we're getting divorced. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. And then, uh, thirdly, the devastating effects on the children, on society. Uh, I can oh, see the kids are going to be all right? That's right. That's yeah, right. No, whatever. No, no. And uh, <laughs> 21 years of teaching high school religion, I, I saw the devastating effects from 1975 to 96. All that was, you know, the divorce rate was just exponentially increased in those 21 years. And wow. And saw the effect with the kids, you know. Mm -hmm. And even in religious life, a lot of, a lot of the kids were getting from broken homes. Father, please explain to these people that these kids are not going to be okay. No, they're not going to be right. Look, I am 52 years old. Right. My parents divorced when I was 16 or mm -hmm. 17. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, me and my sister still ain't right. That's right. And Our I, family is I, not together. No, We're and not. Same with my own family. Uh, in my parents' generation, my parents did a divorce, but a couple of, several of my uh, aunts and uncles did, and those kids. In fact, a couple of them committed suicide. You know, oh, I've seen encouraging the dad and, uh, they left the faith. They got into drugs and the sex and, uh, and all kinds of terrible things. And then they got married and they got divorced. And so it produces a second and third generation of divorced parents and, and kids who are uh, become worse and worse each, uh, each generation. Oh, man. From it. So I've seen it in my own family. <sighs> yeah. They, look, they're not going to be okay, everybody. They're not. <laughs> So please, uh, the last thing is I want to, you know, tell tell us a little bit more about the Fathers of Mercy and their mission. Well, we were founded in the year 1808, so that's 210 years. In the year 1808, when we were founded, that was 19 years, less than 20 years after the French Revolution. So in the faith... And where were you founded? Where was 1808. It? I mean, in. I mean, where? I'm Leon, sorry. Lyon, France, ah, which France. is the southern part of France. Okay. Our founder was Father Jean Baptiste Razan. He was a parish priest and also uh, one of the teachers at the seminary, and he was a very gifted preacher. Mm -hmm. And so Cardinal Fesch of Lyon, who was the he was the uncle of Napoleon the First, asked our uh, founder to find a to start up a band of mission preachers. We were known originally as the Missionaries of France to re-evangelize, to bring back the faith to the uh, French people who had lost it or were fighting it and been under heavy persecution from the civil government. So our work has always been re-evangelization, which is the toughest thing, to bring back the faith from a country that has lost it or is in danger of losing it. And so, so that's the main mission to the get mission. the ones that are falling away, bring that's them right, back, bring them back, and also to evangelize others who, can, who have the faith, yes. and to uh, catechize, catechize others who do not have the faith, and, and, uh, and to bring them into the church. And so we had the mission ban, and we were very successful all through France. And then later on, when the French, some of the French pilgrims migrated to Canada and the U.S., we start sending priests there too. So we had a foundation in Canada and all over the U.S. And so we grew there. 1903, we were ousted from France. There was a lot of anti-clericalism, and we became an excusely French, uh, excuse me, an American community in the early 1900s. <clears throat> we were in uh, New York in the East Coast, and then we went into Kentucky back about 1956, thereabouts, have a parish that we still have in Glassville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And then we continued our work of preaching parish missions and retreats all throughout the years, and we're still doing that today. So you do conferences, too? You do. I asked mm -hmm. you about that. Conferences, right. parish missions. Mm -hmm. What is the devotion? I, I've never heard of the 40 hours of devotion. What is that? Right. Well, it goes way back many centuries, and basically it's a Eucharistic devotion. You expose oh. the Blessed Sacrament. Okay. Yeah. 
And then for 40 hours, you do preaching uh, like in the morning, in the uh, afternoon, in the evening. And the, usually the classical way is that the, for 40 hours, the uh, Eucharist is exposed in the church, even through the night. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's a very, very um, intensive period of Eucharistic adoration meant to stimulate and arouse the faith in the Eucharist and, and in the people. So, Wow. Father, this has been a nice hour. We are done, mm -hmm. and I really want to appreciate you coming and allowing me to talk to you. Sure. You use a lot of insight, and I'm, okay. I'm sure the people will get a lot of insight on what you said. Absolutely. And um, hopefully, I know I'm liking this 40-hour devotion. I might right. try to uh, get, get y'all to come for that, too. <laughs> right. well, I'm a little veteran at that, too. <laughs> okay. And uh, also, I have a weekly radio show on Alpha Enterprises International at 3 to 4 Eastern Time every Wednesday. I'm talking, I'm preaching on the catechism, giving a section-by-section -section analysis. Oh, okay. It's going to take me two or three years. Oh, wow. So when we get done, I want you to give me sure. um, that. I'll do Can you all keep that. it the website? Yeah. Um, Alpha uh, International Enterprises. Then you go on there and then we Google it, and then it has a radio page. You hit the radio page. Mm -hmm. When you get on the radio page, then you can hit on the on the upper left hand corner. There's three bars. You'll hit that, and I'll have schedule and podcasts. So if it's right at three to four in the afternoon, uh, Eastern Standard Time, you can hit the schedule, and I'll be talking. Uh, Wednesday's my live show, and then the la other six days are just a rebroadcast of my live show for that Beautiful. whole week. And then uh, on the podcasts are my uh, earlier. Uh, earlier sessions, earlier times I've spoken weeks before that. So, All right. Well, all right, Father, well, thank you for coming by. And welcome. next time you come to one of the parish missions again or we do a 40 hours, I'm going to have you on right. again. All, all right. right, absolutely. Can you bless us out? Blessing Almighty God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Son upon you, may you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Absolutely. Bye. Take care. I hope you enjoyed part two of my interview with the entertaining Father Louis Guardiola. In conclusion, as we always do, we end with a quote from Pope Benedict XVI. Quote, society offers you comfort, but you weren't made for comfort. You were made for greatness. So go forth, Christian soldier. The spiritual fight is upon you. Fast. Pray and prepare for battle. Thank you, Christian soldier, for listening in today. Remember, Catholic Alpha Radical is designed to repair, ignite, and once again spark the fire back into your marriage or relationship. So, what's your next action step? One, share this podcast with someone needing help in their marriage or relationship. Two, rate this podcast if listening on iTunes. Three, subscribe to this podcast if listening on CatholicAlpha.com to get new episodes in your email now.